Are museums going woke? My name is Tim Stanley. I'm a columnist and a historian, and I'm worried that museums and galleries are being dragged into the culture war. Items returned, exhibits decolonized, history transformed into a moral fable. So in this film, I'm going to explore what's really going on and why is it happening. I'll be talking to a series of stakeholders and commentators to discuss how museums in Britain are rapidly changing. I began by speaking with Charles Samuris Smith, who was the director of the National Gallery and the Royal Academy. He is less sure that there is a woke revolution going on in British museums. Charles, are museums woke? My general feeling is there are changes in the way museums are interpreting their collections. In some museums, certainly not in all of them. I've just been into the National Gallery to see if I could detect any signs of wokeness. Somebody had said that the Freud exhibition has touches of wokeness, but there were none that I could spot, except there's a one gallery which is called Par, which I suppose you could say is drawing attention to the fact he painted well-known people, but that didn't seem to me too off-putting. I mean, the ones in London, which are a tiny bit woke, uh, is the Museum of the Home, which got rid of the name Geoffrey and has redisplayed its collection in a way which might be regarded as work. It's broader, it's more contemporary, it contextualizes its history. But if that's what work is, I don't think in many ways it's bad. Is there a trend towards uh, people rethinking the way that they present their exhibits and their collections? Yeah, yes, over a long period of time. <laughs> I mean, I was involved in the 80s in a move which was called the New Museology. And the New Museology was an attempt to make people think about how exhibitions came into being and how collections were displayed, and to think of display as something active rather than passive. Mm -hmm. A consequence of that is that most, many people who work in museums have been trained in museum studies. Certainly not all. Many of them are trained as traditionally curators. But there is a greater interest in, I think, the politics of display. Some of the displays of so-called wokeness come actually not from curators, but from communication staff. Can you describe your experiences uh, with the National Gallery and the Royal Academy when it comes to this issue? Yes, yeah, so when I went to the National Gallery, actually the culture was very deeply embedded and highly traditional and from my perspective, fairly inflexible. So that there was a way of doing things, which was the National Gallery way of doing things. I can't help but notice that actually, there are signs of that changing, partly because the National Gallery is going to celebrate its 200th anniversary in 2024, and they've taken the paintings off display from the Sainsbury Wing. And they're obviously trying to reconsider and rethink, well, how do you do it? Probably in a somewhat less traditional way. And I would guess that they will consider doing things according to subject and not just according to national culture. That, that's the likely change. My experience in both institutions is not of the incursion of wokeness, if you look, are going to look at it like that, but actually relatively traditional institutions doing things in a relatively traditional way. People say museum decolonization is just a right-wing fantasy but it is happening. Here's a few recent examples collated by the think tank Policy Exchange. The Museums Association published guidance on tackling colonialism in a collection, which it defines as oppression, extraction of resources, and silencing other ways of being and knowing. A research project at the National Gallery highlighted the links between slavery and paintings, Kew Gardens pledged to address the racist or exploitative legacies contained in its collection of plants. The Swansea National Waterfront Museum discussed decolonizing an exhibition about a train in recognition of the links between slavery and steam. And the Darcy Thompson Zoology Museum held a review of its stuffed animals, including a stuffed echidna that it claimed explorers had made look comical. To discuss why museums are making these changes, I sat down with Sir Trevor Phillips, who authored a report called History Matters for the Think Tank Policy Exchange, which investigated national concerns about the growing trend to alter public history and heritage without due process. 
A lot of the criticism of us talking about this subject is people will say this is a right-wing talking point, a culture war distraction. Is something actually going on in museums? Yes, and it's part of a much wider problem. One of the reasons that I think you probably find that people are unwilling to talk to you about it is that not so much that the curators of, uh, or the heads of museums and galleries are themselves in trouble, but it causes trouble. Many of the people who work for them, their staff, have a view which is summarized, whether correctly or incorrectly, as the woke view, that um, they should constantly be atoning for the sins of the past, that uh, any sensitivities, whether legitimate or evidenced or not, uh, should provoke action and so on. And if they don't do that, then they themselves are accused of being racist or colonialist in their mentality and so on. What's interesting about that is uh, you're saying it's not just coming from outside. It's not that there's been a phenomenon that's happened outside museums and museums have felt they've got to catch up with that. It's actually that it's coming from inside museums. Oh, for sure, yes. Right. Uh, oh, yeah, no, no, the, the drive for this is largely amongst a white uh, graduate class of people who work in the museum and gallery sector and who are by and large under 30. Mm -hmm. There isn't, for example, um, a huge wave of angst amongst Nigerian Britons that the Benin bronzes must go home. This is something which is all about uh, that class of person and at the heart of it, um, one of the reasons that I feel rather strongly about, about this is that it stopped being about the colonized people. It stopped being about the other side of this. And it has now become entirely, frankly, a Eurocentric project about young white people and their desire to demonstrate that they are compassionate, that they care, and that they're ready to atone. And if they're ready to atone, everybody else must join in the exercise. They would say, uh, putting aside, I, I, think they, they, I think they would agree that it's simply a matter of fact that Britain has been created by a racist heritage. But putting that aside, they would say principally what they really want to do is just to diversify so that institutions look more like a changing country. And is it really so bad to say that in the course of doing that, you might take down some things, you might put new things in their place, recontextualize? How do you respond to the, the, the charge that really we are complaining about something which is really just about modernizing and, and getting our cultural institutions to reflect the country as it is? In theory, it's absolutely correct. I mean, that's the point, to try to be as comprehensive as possible. But in practice, that isn't actually what's being asked for. History is a story that we tell ourselves about the past. And the essential point here is that, like journalists, like authors, we have to select. But I think that uh, what is being asked here for is not a complete record, because that's not going to be possible, actually but a different version of the record which reflects a contemporary idea of what Britain is. So, for example, people will say, well, what we need to do is to select, what they're really saying is, let's select the items that demonstrate that Britain is irredeemably and completely and 100% about race and racism and that everything is shaped by that fact. Now, you know, you don't have to be some sort of craven idiot who says there's never been prejudice or that isn't part of our structural, uh, structured into the way we see things in this country to say, you know what, it's a bit more complicated than everybody was a terrible racist and everybody now needs to uh, atone for that. As museums and galleries promote diversity and decolonization, I wondered how this was impacting more traditional and conservative artists. To find out, I went to Brixton to attend an event of dissenting artists. But I bring you a message of hope, one of renewal. Indeed, the state's approval will become a stain, a badge of dishonour, 
So tell me what it's like in the world of the arts at the moment. Just give me an overview of what it's like working in arts. It's pretty chilly at the moment. Uh, I think that uh, if you work in the public arts and you depend on public funding, or at least you rely on the good graces of public venues, then you're somewhat constrained by the political considerations of those venues and the funding organisations. I think this has um, done something to create something of a culture of fear or at least a culture of tension and caution um, where people feel like they can't speak their mind and that they're looking over their shoulders regarding their political opinions, their sympathies and even their um, aesthetic tastes. Maybe you can name names, maybe you can't, but can you give an example of, uh, of someone who wanted to do something and was put off doing it or didn't get funding for it? Or Well, I can't give you a specific example that I can share, but I can say that you just look at the programmes, you've seen lots of art promoting um, gay themes, uh, sexual equality, um, celebrating transgenderism and so forth, um, also immigration and refugees and so on. Um, you've never seen a public arts venue which has celebrated ethnic British identity, you've never seen a recent um, exhibition celebrating the importance of Christianity in the centrality of British life. Um, you've never seen anything um, advancing the case for traditional marriage. You spend um, any time in galleries and you just won't encounter these things in contemporary settings or in contemporary events. I guess what a lot of people would say is this is about making up for past wrongs, that for a long time art was dominated by certain people and certain themes. And this isn't about silencing anyone so much as it's about expanding the range of voices and inviting more people in. Okay, well I would say firstly there is only a set amount of resources. Uh, certainly when you're talking in terms of public funding, the budget doesn't suddenly get larger because you have more people applying for money, you just have more competition. And if allocation of resources is being directed by demographics, this is necessarily unfair. So you're getting people who are being excluded because of their skin colour, because of their sexuality. They just happen to be white, they happen to be male, they happen to be straight. Also I would say that in terms of being disadvantaged, I would say that the women, the black artists, the gay or queer artists, very, very few of them have suffered direct discrimination in the West. It's been many decades since that's been a problem. So the people who are benefiting are not the people who suffered. You could say that the people from 50 or 100 years ago really did suffer and perhaps they deserve more of a hearing, but they're not the ones who are applying for grants right now. The culture wars are often viewed as a modern phenomenon. However, there are those who have been debating these very same issues for decades. One such person is Michael Daly, a sculptor and cartoonist who runs a group called Art Watch UK. I asked Michael whether these culture wars go back longer than we think. Museums are now going woke and, and they have been effectively uh, for 20, 30, 40 years. The Arts Council was set up to provide funding because it was expected at the end of the war that with taxation at 97% there wouldn't be many people able to work as patrons. So Kenneth Clark and Maynard Keynes converted a little committee for encouraging music and arts during the war for morale purposes, turned that into the Arts Council and that grew and by the uh, late 60s and 70s it had become an autonomous force. The art was pushed in an anti-art, anti-painting, anti-sculpture direction over a long period. It was political, it was art political, but now it's just morphed into whatever's going and the distinction between artists and activists has pretty much gone. I think that at the heart of this issue is a simple question. What are our public institutions for? Are they a neutral meeting ground where you and I can access beauty and ideas from around the world? Or are they a political space where activists try to fix what they see as a broken Britain by relabeling or even cancelling the past? The activists regard themselves as egalitarians, but setting yourself up as judge and jury on British history feels a little bit elitist.